Big Buck Registry, Big Buck Podcast, episode number six. All right, welcome to the show, everybody. This is Jay Scott, your host with the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast, episode number six. Uh, we've come quite a ways from episode number one, and we have had some fantastic interviews along the way. And I want to say thank you from the Big Buck Registry to our Big Buck listeners. Uh, we could not do this without you, and we really appreciate and hope you enjoy the content that we're putting forth on this show. And um, Hope you keep coming back. So uh, just a couple of uh, housekeeping notes. I wanted to first just go over some of our websites and some, a piece of new technology that we have just launched on the Big Buck Registry website. Um, you can find us at www.bigbuckregistry.com, and that's our website. You can also find us on Facebook, which is www.facebook.com forward slash Big Buck Registry, and on Twitter www.twitter.com forward slash big buck registry and if you want to check us out there i think you'll see many many pictures of some great deer taken over the last season and a few older ones too which are really cool to look at uh, the new technology that we have is uh, for all of our listeners to share their stories or ask a question or share a comment about what you like don't like about the big buck registry and you don't even need a phone all you need is a computer and a microphone or if you have an iphone you could do it that way as well you, you're not dialing you're not using your cell coverage you're just using the um, a, a web app that is been that has been designed for the iphone so if you go to our website www.bigbuckregistry.com you'll see a tab on the left hand side that will show and if you click on that it'll bring you to another page and you can record with your computer right then and there a question a story or anything else that you want to send to us and that will put it in audio format and send it to us directly it'll also allow you to edit a little bit so you can you can test it you can record your your audio you can record your voice and if you play it back you'll hear what it sounds like and if you don't like it you can record it again so you can do that on a computer you can also do that through an iphone which is uh pretty cool uh downloadable app that you can get on your iphone and you can do the same thing there so that's the housekeeping and we have an amazing amazing lineup for you today and this is a special edition extended show we skipped last week we had a few things we had to take care of with some other shows um and by the way this will probably be one of the last uh big buck registry podcast of the season we're going to switch over to turkey hunting here in a little bit and start broadcasting from the longbeardregistry.com site and uh, the the Talking Turkey podcast. So if you want to tune into some other hunting-related items, uh, check us out at thelongbeardregistry.com. And we may have a few other exp uh, special editions along the way, but... Uh, this will probably be the season wrap-up of season number one of the Big Buck Registry Big Buck Podcast. And we'll see you back again for sure in September. But again, we may have a few along the way. So we have today the special extended version of Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. And number one, the first uh, person we have on the show is Shannon Bowling. And Shannon <clears throat> is one of those amazing deer hunters that just seems to have a knack for taking down big bucks. And it wasn't it's not by chance. He has honed his craft along the years and over the years. And now he shares with us all his tips and tricks that he uses, uh, much like uh, Jim Kruger did last week or last time. And uh, you're going to want to tune in because if you're just looking for some other techniques on what works and what doesn't when you're hunting a big buck, we get into some very intimate details here um, that'll help you 
bring your deer hunt to the next level. So definitely tune in to Shannon's interview. Uh, after that, we're going to speak to Ed and John Markowitz, and we're going to talk about the torch buck, uh, also known as the ghost buck. Uh, this buck has nine lives, and he's uh, we. It, John and Ed have been hunting him for the last two or three years. He, they've gotten many photos of him on their game cam. They've also seen uh, some video of him. They've seen him in live in person in the field, and they just can't quite put it all together. Uh, actually, they thought Torch had died at, as a result of a uh, bow hunting um, hunt and uh, where they heard, had heard that Torch had taken a double long shot and uh, they sent in some pictures. We had a, a video posted on our site a while back, kind of telling the story. But we actually get to speak to Ed and John. They finally came forward and agreed to an interview. So uh, we're going we're gonna to listen to those guys tell the story. It's really kind of cool. Uh, we're going to switch it up a little bit. We're going to speak with Justin O'Neill from True Blood Outdoors and some bear hunting down south. And then back by popular demand, we have some more interviews with Aaron Hill out of Iowa, and he's going to share some more of his really great Iowa buck hunting stories um, and some more tips and tricks that he uses using a pistol. Uh, his primary choice, his primary weapon of choice, is uh, a pistol for hunting big whitetail. So that's uh, something we don't usually hear. And then finally, um, it's time. It is time to announce the winner, the winners of the 2012 Big Buck Registry Big Buck Podcast Deer of the Year. And we will announce and reveal the winner at the very end of this show. So stay tuned, everybody, and uh, we'll be right back. Hey, folks, this is Jim Kruger from antleritis.com, and you're listening to the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Okay, so guest number one is Shannon Bowling. Shannon is an amazing deer hunter and accomplished deer hunter. Uh, really has honed his craft, and we were able to sit down with Shannon and get all of his tips and tricks that he uses to harvest big deer. So uh, let's uh, tune in and listen to Shannon. Welcome back, everybody. This is Jay Scott, your host with the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast, and I am here with a very special guest. Uh, we're here with Shannon Boiling, um, or Bowling, and Shannon uh, submitted what is come to be known as the triple d buck um it's an amazing photo we'll put some pictures on the podcast notes of it but shannon and i i wanted to preach uh, say thank you for for joining us on the show well thanks for having me thanks for having me very cool uh you have a an amazing deer here um mm -hmm. and i'm looking at the picture right here and uh if you could just kind of describe the buck a little bit um he's uh he's a um a non-typical. I mean, he's uh, a typical eight-pointer is what he is. He scored uh, 162 as an eight-pointer. Uh, he grossed uh, 191 as a non-typical with uh, somewhere around uh, 29, uh, 30 inches of uh, non-typical points during Crockett score. Wow. Uh, it's, uh, it's I'm just I'm mesmerized by this rack. It, it looks like you've got a drop tine and uh, two drop tines on uh, the other side. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's got uh, two drops on the right and a nine and three quarter inch drop on the uh, the left hand side. That's crazy. And, uh, uh, what what's a, going on with the the drop tine on the left there? Uh, I guess it would be on uh, my it's right. Still got some velvet on it. It's, it's still in got some velvet on it. The big long drop tine still got some velvet on it. I killed him on September seventeenth in two thousand and eleven. Gotcha. So he's just coming out of velvet. What a great great deer. That's unbelievable. Um, yeah, the, uh, take us uh take us through the hunt a little bit um you've you have other big deer that you've shot and yeah you, you know, you've sent some stuff to me by f or fb mail we call it uh facebook yeah. mail and we definitely want to have you on frequently to talk about some of these other deer sure i enjoy that uh, so would um, we with the triple d buck i uh i first uh made contact with that buck on a late summer scout trip uh I come in and uh we ate dinner, and uh, I'm always checking the fields and things, but uh, I'm not like some guys that drive out in the middle of the field right when it's prime time. I was actually in a tobacco barn uh, up about 30 feet uh, hmm. watching an alfalfa field and uh, knew there was deer in there and, and hadn't hunted that property in uh, probably a couple of years. I hunt Indiana, Ohio, and this deer was particularly it was killed in Kentucky, hmm. not a half a mile from my house. 
and uh, it was probably a half hour before daylight, and uh, three bucks come into the field, and uh, Triple D was one of them, and that was the first look I got at it. Uh, okay, so, so this Go is ahead. a Kentucky deer. Yes, this is Kentucky, yes. Gotcha. And whereabouts in Kentucky? You don't have to, I don't want coordinates. This by is any means. Owen County. This is northern Kentucky. Northern Kentucky. Okay. Northern Kentucky, yes. Northern Kentucky. Down in the western place, Valley, uh, Illinois, where they kill all the big ones. This is in northern Kentucky. Uh, Owen County has the biggest deer harvest every year of any other county in the state. Gotcha. And this uh, this county touches Illinois? To the north? No, this county does not. No, no, it doesn't. The western, the western part of the state where they kill a lot of the big deer in Kentucky is, uh, you know, right across the river from Illinois. It gets flatter. This is hill country up in here. Okay, so this is okay. all. This is 100 percent Kentucky. Doesn't doesn't border anything. No, this is 100 percent Kentucky right here. Gotcha. 100 percent Kentucky whitetail. Excellent. Uh, well, it has some very large character characteristics like you'd see in or hear about in Illinois. So uh, the message yeah. here, I think, is that there are big deer in Kentucky. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, it was actually featured in uh, uh, Kentucky Outdoors. Yeah. And uh, actually, uh, they run another program on that deer uh, the spring of this year, uh, Kentucky Outdoors. Me and Stan Pot with the deer, Stan Potts, you know, the, the big a big deer hunter for a North American whitetail, and it was actually me and him was there, and they had a big article saying Kentucky's number one in Boone and Crockett right now. For square mile, Kentucky is number one in Boone and Crockett. Is that right? For square mile, yes. Interesting. That's good to know. That's good for our listeners to know as well. <clears throat> yeah. So you're. This is uh, what was the date on the on the kill again? It was September seventeenth, two thousand eleven. Two thousand eleven. So first. Yep. Yeah. First encountered the deer. Uh, late July of that, that same year, late July. Mm-hmm. And uh, I didn't really mess with them. There's a lot of guys around here like to drive around these fields late in the evening, just like anywhere else in the country. You're trying to hunt a deer or whatnot. I mean, I, I try to pinpoint specific deer and hunt those deer. And uh, I've had great success doing it, but uh, you've always got the neighbors that's going to run them off the fields and everything every night. Um, this particular deer, I've never seen him in that field again. And I only went back maybe twice more because I knew the property. I've been hunting it since I've been seven or eight. So I knew the property well. So I started setting up trail cam pictures, and uh, I probably got seven, 800 trail cam pictures of this deer up to the date that I harvested it. No kidding. So you, this, uh, this place in Owen County is mm-hmm. on a tobacco farm? Well, it's no, it's not a tobacco farm. It's just a, just a farm. This farm, okay. It, yeah, I mean... Uh, but you were, farm, I mean, they raise tobacco. I mean, they raise tobacco all over here, but you can only raise it on the ridge tops and in the bottom land. So, okay. I mean, it's, it's pretty hilly country here. It's a lot of pasture. It's probably mostly cows. Oh, when, when you first saw the deer, you were actually in a tobacco barn? Yes. Okay. Yes. And that was in July, pre-season. That was in July, yeah. Okay. So you saw the buck. You started planting some... Yeah, game, I started... Game. Uh, yeah, I started, uh, you know, putting some uh, cameras out and... Uh, trying to figure out what he's doing because our in Kentucky, you know, we're blessed with the early season where, right. you know, it usually comes open the first weekend of September every year in Kentucky here for the last, I'm thinking five or six, don't quote me on that. It may not be right, but the last five or six years, it comes open on the first. Okay. So it gives you an opportunity to hunt, you know, and shoot a, uh, a velvet deer, which I, my personal preference, I don't like velvet deer. Yeah. You can't score them right. Uh, it's just, I just don't like a velvet deer, so I never hunted this deer till he come out on velvet. Right, right. Uh, but that is an early season. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Um, yeah, and uh, I had to, well, I, like I said, I was putting uh, trail cameras up and stuff, and I hunted the deer the first time on September the 4th. Season come in three days before that, which was Labor Day. We had a cookout, and I went in there at noon to check my trail cameras, and he was actually, I was getting some daylight pictures of him. Mm-hmm. So I hunted him that evening. I had a, a good wind. Uh, of course, it didn't work out for me that evening. Um, and then I actually tried the same stand. I set that stand that day. I actually stand, tried the same stand the next week because I had some more daylight pictures of him in the same area. And with all the pressure of the people driving around, it's it's like that anywhere. You know, I can tell everybody. Everybody knows that there's somebody that's always going to pull up in the field every night and check on a deer. And this, this field was pretty close to the road. And... Uh, as far as I know, nobody else ever seen this deer except for me live on the hoof. 
Really? So the the deer was hanging around a, a road, and is it common to... to uh, it, like, was, it was it was a little off the road, but, I mean, you could actually see the field from the road. So okay. this deer didn't get this field very often until after dark. Okay. So and, I kind of figured that out with the trail cam pictures. Okay, and so... And I you, got back... Go ahead. You were able to educate yourself on its, on its movement based sure. off of the trail cams. Sure, yes. Gotcha. And one thing I can stress with all the deer that I've killed, and I've, I've been lucky and God's blessed me enough to, to kill several good deer. I never go into the woods when I think the deer that I'm hunting is on his feet. Never, ever do I ever go in the woods or go anywhere in a field where I think he might be. That's one of my, my things. But, uh, but anyhow, on the third hunt, I checked my trail cameras. Only two other guys, three other guys knew about this deer. And that's just choice people that I told about it that I shared the photos with. Okay. People that I could trust. And right. then my, my family, my wife, Tammy, and my daughter, Kaylee, knew right. about it. And that's why I got the name Triple D, because Kaylee was calling it Triple D. <laughs> and, uh, what does Triple D stand for? Uh, triple Drop Time. Triple Drop Time. Okay. Now, yeah. what kind of trail cameras are you using? I'm using Moultrie. Moultrie. Moultrie, uh, non-flash. Yeah, okay. The, uh, the blackout cameras. Blackout and is it the is a newer version with the SD card and the smaller? Uh, it's the M80s, I think, is the M80s. Yeah, M80s. with the with the cards. Yeah. Okay, we're we're hearing that we're hearing Moultrie more and more. That the that name yeah. comes up a lot with these game cameras. I mean, there's a lot out there to pick from, but everybody seems to be liking the Moultries. Yeah, I may be able to afford one a year, so that's what I've been buying because they last me several years. Yep. Yeah. I, I can't afford. I mean, I'm just, I'm a working class man, just like you know. Probably, you know, 98% of the hunters out there, you know, working right. class, try to spend the extra money where they can in the wisest way they can. Right. Well, you want uh, the uh, you want the tool, um, yeah. but it seems to be in the that, right that price tool, point. Yeah, I'm, 40, I'm 41 years of age, and that tool right there has really helped me yeah. a lot in the last few years. I mean, it allows you to stay out of there and let your equipment do the work for you. But uh, there's so many hunters out here, I mean, just the guys around here that I hunt with i mean it's just you know they want to go in there and that evening time oh i gotta go check the feeder or i gotta do this or i gotta do that and they do it right at prime time and they really i think i believe they mess themselves up so they're che- they're they're not hunting during prime time they're just checking stuff <laughs> yeah i mean i mean before season and during season i mean that's that's the only, i mean that's that's why i think i've killed so many deer but right. this is a heavy hunted area Owen county is a heavy hunted area and, uh, you know, everybody, you know, they got their little lease or they've got their farm they hunt on, and they just, they brutalize it. They run these deer into the thickets. I mean, this deer was four and a half years old when I killed him. I'd never laid eyes on him, and nobody else had either. Right. And this is a heavy hunted area. So this deer was smart. Okay. He knew how to stay out of the limelight. What I'm getting the, back to, go ahead. Uh, t- take us back to the... Um the hunters you said something about they would uh do they shine the the fields at night that kind of thing no but they'll get out about half hour 15 minutes before dark and they'll drive their pickup trucks and eat up into each every field around here to see what they can see on the fields and, and pray, basically educate the deer and smarten the deer and they just run off the fields to to the point where they're just drove nocturnal I mean, I they just will not come into any kind of feeding area nocturnal so you know, I mean, it's just, it's, they're going to be after dark. And that's kind of what this deer was. Before August, this deer never showed its, never showed itself anywhere around where anybody could see it before dark. He never did because of, for that simple fact that, uh, you know, I mean, there's several people right here that do that. I mean, they just drive around. I mean, I've done it when I was younger. I'm sure you know people that's done it, you know, let's go out and see if we can see some deer. And they, sure. you know, prime time and they're, they're running them off. And uh, it's, you know, you're just educating a deer. I mean, I, I really feel that. Yeah, I think once you get onto their turf with, you know, by foot or by vehicle, it, it tends to change their patterns to the point where it becomes a disadvantage for you as a hunter. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, kind of screws it sure. up for everybody. One bad egg, you know? Yeah. But yeah. I was uh, I was fretting about this deer, and then, uh, like I said, on uh, on the 16th, I checked my cameras at noon. I, I'm lucky enough to have a job that I get to come home for lunch. Yeah. And uh put my rubber boots on and uh, I only had I was able to drive pretty close to where my cameras were and, and I seen that he'd been there for pretty much four days straight, coming up the same trail right before dark. 
he wasn't entering the fields before dark, and this was probably 200 yards from the actual feeding location. Okay, so you so saw out. you're in this area. You know the deer's there, or you have a hunch. You start laying. Yeah, out. I knew where he was bedding at. I knew where he was. I knew because I knew the area real well, and I knew where the deer were bedding at. Okay. I knew where he was bedding at. It was just picking the right trail for him to come out, and okay. I had cameras on those trails. So you without you, pushing him into that bedding area. How many different cameras and how many different trails are you monitoring at this point? At that point, it was three three different uh, areas where where I could uh, where I could uh, check on him. Three different areas where he was coming. Where pretty much it's a bottleneck area, you know, where they have to almost come to get to this feeding area. Okay. There was a bottleneck, so uh, there was three different ways into this this point. I knew where he was living at. Uh, I knew the deer. You know, I've killed deer on that property before. I knew kind of where they stayed at. And early season is a good time to get them because they're not that spooked. When the, when the guns go off, they, they get a whole lot more spooked. But on the 16th, I, I found several trail cam pictures of him using the same trail every night. And you can pattern them on a feeding pattern mm-hmm. at that time, point of the year. It's not like the rut. You don't know if he's three counties over or whatnot. Some people believe. But but uh, anyway, I set a stand that very day. And... Uh, I set a stand, and it was probably uh, 1230 in the afternoon where he had no idea I was in there. Mm-hmm. Set a stand, uh, got in that stand at uh, 2 o'clock the next day. It wasn't getting dark until almost 8 o'clock, but I didn't want to. I wanted all the air. I had the wind in my direction, I had the wind in my benefit and also his benefit. From where the field he was headed to, he could smell the air from that area, but he still couldn't smell me. I was 35 foot in the tree. Gotcha. And, uh he wanna, came in actually 25, 25 minutes before before dark and uh, offered me an eighteen yard shot. That's cool. I want to go back to the prep just a little bit more. So you you placed uh, the cameras. You you got out uh, midday twelve thirty. Mm-hmm. You, you read your cameras and you made the call from there. So all your activity on the field was not done. In the evening, not done in the morning. It was during a time frame in which the buck... Yeah, it was anywhere from uh, 11.30 in the morning till uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. I never went into that area ever past the barn or anything else after that point in time. Gotcha. And that that ensures that that buck's going to stay put, not going to interfere, you're not going to spook him. Exactly. And you're going to exactly. be able to... Gotcha. So you you went and you checked your camera midday. You got the, the you figured out which trail he was tending to come in on into this field yes. routinely, and then mm-hmm. it was at that time you you had your stand with you, and you well well I had to stand in the truck. Yeah, and I that stand that day. Well, it was uh, you know like I told my wife and then my buddy from Ohio, my good friend Stanley Suda, which is in the, the December edition of North American Whitetail this year. His deer's on the cover. We hunt together a lot. Yep. I told him to get ready to, and he actually had a cameraman with him in Grant County, and he told me to call him as soon as I squeezed the trigger, pretty much, as soon as I uh, let the arrow fly that night, and because uh, I told him it was going to happen. So you you predicted it. I knew it, it was going to happen felt that it. night. You knew well, it was coming. Well, he's done the he finally done the same thing three times in a row. Right. And when you get a when you get a deer, he felt comfortable coming through that area at that time of day. He felt comfortable coming through there, and I knew that that's all it took. Right. You you had a hunch that this was going to happen because you had some evidence that it was happening routinely. And we had a steady wind for, for those uh, four days, too, and I had the same wind. Okay. Uh, I'm a firm believer. I mean, yeah, you might have the wind in your favor every time, but I'm a firm believer that if, if that wind is not in that buck's favor, he's not coming in. Right. I mean, if he can't smell or the danger that he's seen – throughout his whole life is coming from if he can't smell that area he's not coming in till after till after dark D- tell me a little bit more about what you mean by that so you this buck well the the, the wind was in my favor because i was up high enough up on a point yep. to where he, the wind was blowing over the bedding area but on the same hand the actual wind was blowing in his face from where he expected danger to be which was up towards his feeding area where he always gets run off the field by pickup trucks or, you know, there's always farmers there or whatnot. Right. Where he expected danger to come from, He the wind was coming from that direction, so he could smell anything that was up there before he even got close to there. Okay. So the wind was in his favor, but it was also in my favor. And I've killed three deer by doing that very same thing. Make sure the wind is in their favor and also in my favor. 
Now, are you whether it be getting behind behind him or whatnot? But if you're getting if you're killing a deer that's on a feeding pattern, he has got to know what's where. He's got to get that win, or you got to set up to where he knows when he's coming up into that that feeding area. He can smell anything around there, and that that just gives you bonus. I mean, you don't have to have it like that. I mean, some deer they just walk right in for some people, but I mean for me. They have to be able to smell where they're headed to. I and mean, it was a perfect setup. It was. It was just like if in the story of North American Lifetime, I mean, it's just like you read the script. I mean, he come right up through there, close to shooting lane. I, you know, I didn't cut anything out of the tree. And I just, I didn't, I didn't bugger anything up and I didn't cut anything out of the tree. I picked the perfect tree. There was a perfect tree there. I mean, it's just like it was meant to be okay. when he come up through there. So as the wind is blowing, it's, it's, is it, coming over you first and then down into his bedding area or you were completely a, away from there i was completely away from his bedding area but the, the travel corridor he was taking he was coming up through a bottleneck and i was on the upwind side of that bottleneck but i was up up on a point to where to where the wind was blowing completely over top of him and any other deer that was coming through there with the steady wind we had that night okay but it was also blowing from those fields that he was planning on going to right straight into his nose gotcha. at ground level. So he knew that there was nothing up in there, so he felt comfortable about getting, you know, when he come up, and it was like a transition zone. There was there was not only him, there was probably 15 other deer right around me at that point in time. Wow. So and he felt comfortable coming because no other deer had blown, no other deer had seen. There was already deer on the field, I know that for sure, because... I'd already seen them, the does and everything. They were already on the field. Gotcha. So he didn't hear any blowing, any, he didn't hear any kind of, you know, activity up there. He could smell them or, or whatnot. That's what I believe. So the but, wind, uh, the, as he's coming up into the field, the wind's in his face? Yes. Okay. And you're above that wind at that point? Yeah. Okay. I'm up off that wind, yeah. I mean, I, I, I positioned myself to the point where I didn't think he could smell me or I'd never hunted him. That, gotcha. That, like, so you didn't have any, like, thermals, like, taking your your scent and then d- dropping it down to the ground it oh, was, i was right up on a ridge top yeah I on was, a ridge top taking it out and it was blowing it straight over top of the the ho- well what we call hollers up here yeah you know so in other words the the atmosphere was enough so it wasn't pushing down on the wind it was drawing it up and what he was smelling was still a, a, a wind. what he was smelling what was what was on that field and what he was curious about what's up on that field where he right. was going to right all right so well, the, he you know put in his mind that it was a safe place to right. So, so, come on up through there. So the wind kind of he had no idea. He had no idea I was in this county or anywhere in the state of Kentucky when he come through there. Right. So the wind, he's just reading the wind like he always always would. Yeah. Like he always would every right. day, like any big bug would. <clears throat> he a deer isn't smart enough to let to know that a wind blowing is in his face is coming up or down, right? No. But, but I mean, but, I'm a firm believer that if you can get that wind in his favor and also yours. Right. Your odds is done. Right. It's went up fifty percent. Right. Then. Right. So it can read in its face, but it can't. It, it, a deer isn't smart enough to say, "All right, so the there, there's an atmosphere that's pulling wind up off the field because it's still in his face." So yeah. only only a human would really know that. Yeah, I knew by trail cameras he wasn't hitting that field until dark. He would right. not get in that field before dark. Right. Gotcha. So you you get in your stand, um, and it's uh, the sun's gone is going down. Um, yeah, the sun where, just crested over the hill. Yeah. Where is the sun in, in relation to your it's shooting It's actually lane? right to my left. It's right to my left. When it goes down over the cedar tops, it's okay. right to my left where I'm standing at. And the, and the deer, is, so the, the sun's on the left. The deer are coming from your right? Yes. Gotcha. Nice. So they're, they're com- are they coming uphill, flat, coming downhill? No, they're coming uphill. Coming they're up coming uphill. uphill. Yeah. And where they were, were they in like a swampy bedding area or just in a lowland? No, so? there's there's no swamps here. It's uh, basically just what you call a gnarly, gnarly thicket that you can't hardly walk through. Okay. It's uh, cedars uh, with hedge apples. Uh, it's basically your Kentucky woods. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> I mean, you get some good oak flats around here, but it's pretty much, if anybody's hunting Kentucky, they'll know what I'm talking about. It's just a gnarly thicket. Just as as gnarly and as nasty as it can get, and that's where the, the yeah, white tail love. They that's where they yep. want to go because nobody else is going to go in there. Gotcha. Yep. So they're coming up. They're coming in to feed. Um, yep. It's feeling safe. Deer's coming right to left. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there was pasture on the right side of him and the left side of him. So nice. if he was going to make it to that 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 point, 
I see what you're saying. He's coming. Come through that nat- bottleneck. Natural funnel bottleneck kind of thing. He's going to try to stay in the woods as long as possible. Oh yeah, he wasn't. Uh, yeah, he was just going to hang out in that area. Like I said, I was 200 yards off of that feeding that feeding area. Gotcha. In his direction, back towards where he was coming from. Yes. Yes. Nice. Where I felt comfortable, where I could get to without him knowing I was there. Right. Beautiful. Um, so you're sh- you shot you're shooting an arrow. Uh, you're shooting a bow, yes. compound bow. Yes. And uh, carbon arrows. Yes, carbon arrows. Okay. Uh, uh, I think they're Beemans. Beemans? Shooting Beeman arrows. Yep. Shooting a Matthew Z7 at the time. Yep. Yep. Uh, Rage Broadheads. Nice. What uh, What grain on the broadheads? 100 grain broadheads. 100 grain. Okay. And the arrows look long. Are they longer than usual? Uh, I shoot a 29-inch uh, draw length with a, uh, a QDA or what they call a, a drop-away rest. Okay. Gotcha. What about the rest of your setup? What are you What are you using for gear um, uh, in your Actually, stand? I had on. Uh, I had on. I only had uh, a couple pairs of britches uh, washed at that time. I'm a very stricter on. Uh, I actually had on GI, just a regular GI um, yep. army pants. Is yep. What I had on. Okay. Cotton. And a mossy oak shirt. All a cotton base kind of material. Yep. And yep. It looks like you got some rubber boots. I can't make out the brand name. Oh yeah, uh, they're muck boots. Muck boots. So you got muck muck rubber boots. You've got some military camouflage, uh, old school um, cotton base and cotton shirt, uh, washed, pre washed. I would assume some kind of yeah, scent killer. Scent killer. killer. Okay. Yep. And you just had to. So it's more you were reading the the wind more than anything. Well, I was worried more of the wind of me going to that area that day. Like I said, I got in the stand at two thirty. Yep around 2 or 2.30, I mean, way before time for, for any deer to move. And I've done that purposely, and I've done it time and time again. Gotcha. Uh, when the rut's on, I stay in a tree stand all day. Well, I don't get out of the tree stand. So it's September 7th? Is that what it was? 17th. 17th. September 17th. It was warm. It was, was it? warm. That yeah. was my next question. What was yeah. the temperature like? Uh, that day it was probably 55, uh, 58, somewhere around that area. Gotcha. And did you put up your stand that same day? No, I put the stand up the day before. Day before, okay. Yeah. All right. So you had you gone in the day before, set it up, um, yeah. planned to hunt the next day. If the wind was right. If yeah. the wind was right, and you went in, you got you set up two thirty, and uh, I come in. I cut wood all morning, up until about one o'clock. I came in. I took a shower and sand killer stuff. Yep. Um, and uh, and I and I went went and got in the tree stand as quick as I could. Gotcha. Um, quick question on, on scent control. And I haven't asked this question of anybody yet, but I, I've always been kind of curious about this. And I, I, do you do anything about like the scent coming from your breath? Uh, do you do it? You chew gum? Do you brush your teeth? What do you, what do you do for that? Uh, I, I don't, okay. I don't do anything. I'm a firm. I, I do all that. I think that that helps, but I think if any, any real good deer hunter can tell you that, uh, if a big mature buck is downwind of you, right straight downwind of you, it don't matter what you use. He's gonna, I don't, you know. I mean, some guys like the the scent walker suits. Uh, me, I can't afford one. Not saying that they don't work or nothing of that that nature, but uh, I can't afford one. So I do everything I can do to eliminate my scent. But if a big deer gets straight downwind from you, he's gonna smell you. Gotcha. So it doesn't matter what. You've got on. It does in a way. I mean, when you're walking through the weeds or if he gets in behind you or something, I mean, maybe just that extra, extra what you've done as far as uh, washing yourself, showering yourself, touching uh, the tree stand steps that you're going up or anything else, that one little bit, and that's what I firm believe. I mean, that one little bit of ounce of, uh, you know, of maybe he's not going to get my wind. You know, yep. I like to play the wind. I'll play the wind. I won't hunt unless I got the wind where i think it's right gotcha so you can bypass the scent blocker scent shield suits if you can read the wind correctly well well yeah i mean some guys will some guys will tell you they won't go in the woods without a scent locker suit yeah i mean I'm it's not saying it's not an advantage because a scent blocker definitely is an advantage sure it is but if you don't have that if you can't buy the product there are alternatives and it goes back to the basics reading yeah, I mean, reading the wind yeah, you, you've got you got. I mean, they say hunt three sixty. <laughs> I'm not going to. 
maybe the next guy will and he'll and he'll kill you know the biggest deer in the world but i'm not going to hunt 360 if that deer has a, any probability of smelling me whatsoever i'm not going to hunt that stand right i'm not going to do it right like you said i mean you're going to perspire you're going to sweat your your breath uh you know just any little thing you know we're humans we stink we do <laughs> especially yeah. the deer absolutely <laughs> But, uh, you know, you get a big mature buck, and I've killed some big mature bucks, and uh, if they get down one of you, they're going to smell you. Right. And they're going to think twice about coming up through there again. And that's that's why I'm a firm believer. I never get in there unless I know that he can't smell me, and I know he's not, he's in his bed. I'm never going to get in there if he's up on his feet. Right. Take us through the final moments of the harvest. Um, you know the deer is coming into the area, correct? Mm-hmm. And you can Yeah, see- I uh, actually... Uh, that night it was uh like i said the deer came out early all the deer did it was a uh, high pressure day i mean there wasn't a whole lot of wind but there was uh, the winds was coming that direction uh had several does and some small bucks already filtering through and there was this little fawn deer that was uh running around still actually had a few spots on it and it was uh crying for its mother it was just running around these cedar thicket looking for its mother i mean it's making all kind of racket mm-hmm. i was sitting there watching that and uh and then i looked down to my right on the trail that most of the deer was coming on and i i seen uh, i seen triple d and he was he was making his way up there and he was watching that fawn and he just sat there and watched that fawn and he come up and he's and at that point i stood for the last three hours of my hunt i stood up i never sat down because i knew that probably i was going to get a chance at him that night and uh he stopped directly 18 yards and uh like i said i was 35 foot in the tree and he stopped and i was already a full draw and I let the arrow go. It it actually hit him right straight in the spine, and he fell straight to the ground. No kidding. Yeah, and he kicked around on his back legs, and I reached back and grabbed another beam and arrow, and uh, he laid his uh, laid his chest wide open, and I, I punched one right up in the yep. right in the right up in the tin ring, and uh, he was down. And I never got tore up until actually I knew he was down. I knew he was a good deer, and uh, Stanley Stanley has caught, killed some really big deer, and. Uh, couple other guys that i stuck with we was figuring the deer around the 180 mark maybe and uh so the, f- the first phone call i made was stanley because we we do that when we kill a deer we've been hunting together for 12 years and i was the first phone call and he answered he was in his tree stand he had deer around him and he knew i wouldn't be calling him a half hour before dark unless i'd killed you know the big deer yeah and i told him he was down he said well i'm coming out of the tree right now and then i called my wife and my daughter and my my daughter was completely beside herself. She was screaming, went up and down. And I posted one of her pictures on the on yours on your site too. Yeah, that was a great picture. I love that yeah. picture. But the, the picture you sent in was great of your daughter, and uh, yeah. it's got a lot of likes. That was actually her first buck. She killed her first deer when she was eight, and she wouldn't shoot a buck unless it was a good one. And uh, that's something we can, you know, she wouldn't shoot a good. Uh, she wouldn't shoot a buck until it was a good one. She shot several does, but. Uh, that deer it was a, it was an awesome hunt and that's the story in itself but uh, i mean it come into a decoy i rattled him in and he come into a decoy and she talked him out of uh, busting our decoy up because he was getting ready to flatten it right gotcha <laughs> how far away was uh triple d when you first saw him coming in when you knew it was going to happen probably 70 yards 70 yards yeah, couldn't mistake the rack. You knew it was it was coming. Oh back. yeah, there's no mistake. And I mean, he's got 27 right. and a half inch beams, 22 inches wide. There's right. no mistake. Were you uh, were you shaking at all? At that point in time, no. no. I was uh, I was just I was focused on uh, making the shot, and yeah. uh, and I had this big limb out in front of me to my right. And as soon as he started going on, it's this big limb. I was actually in a hickory tree, and it still had a lot of leaves on it. Of course, all the trees around here in September has leaves on them. Yeah. But uh, and then when he emerged outside of that that point there, I was already at full draw, and he was on an eighteen yard trail. Gotcha. So you got in the zone pretty quick, and you yeah you, you yeah fought. I'd already my bow was on a hanger sitting right there where I could just reach up and grab it. I mean I had yeah. it all set perfect for him. Did you visualize the harvest? Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, I sat there for five six hours. I visualized it yep. the whole time. You know, everybody does. I mean, when you're hunting deer like that, I mean, you know, you're you're sitting there thinking. I'm I'm standing there and I'm thinking. And you know, every little deer that I hear, or every deer comes out, you're thinking, well, he's on his feet. You know, I'm that's the kind of hunter I am. I'm thinking he's on his feet right now. Is he going to take this trail tonight? You know, and I'm you know, when you know deer, 
long enough, it's just like, you know, it's it's not like fishing. I mean, are they going to bite or not? That deer's there. He's there somewhere. Right. It's not like if he's going to bite or not. If he, is he going to take that right trail for a, for an archer hunter, you know, for a bow hunter? Is he going to take that right trail that night? Is he going to come here that night? Right. Or has something spooked him during the day to where he's decided he's not going to come up here till way up right. dark? That's and he what... was doing that. He wouldn't do the same thing twice. I mean, he would not do the same thing twice. That's why there was 16 days into the the, gun, or the, the bow season here before I ever got an arrow in it. Right. Because he wouldn't do the same thing twice. I hunted him three times, and I killed him on the third time I hunted him. It was when he started to pattern, you, you said, all right, now I think it's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, I, I told uh, Stanley and I told my other two buddies that uh, it was going to happen. Right. And they were all on standby, and, and they really thought it was going to happen, because usually when I tell you it's going to... I had a pretty good hunch that <laughs> right. it was going to happen that right. night. I think it is amazing. Like, you you spend so much time in the woods, and it, t- it takes a little bit of time to learn this, but... Yeah, the deer are kind of like they're ghostly, and all of them are. They yeah. just they can disappear so fast, um, yeah. but they're not gone. They're just no. can't see yeah. them, which is it's, you know, it's like I tell these guys around here. I have guys tell me, "How do you kill big deer every year?" Or, you know, "How do you kill so many big deer?" You know, and I'm hunting the same place, you know, forever. You know, in the same county, or or, or you know, I'm going here and I'm going there. I said, "Well, because I don't do the same things." over and over and over again expecting different results right i said first and foremost to kill a big deer you gotta hunt where they live i mean right I mean, if you want to kill giant deer i mean you gotta hunt where they live i mean i was blessed and god blessed me with this deer uh you know and i really truly believe that he did bless me with this deer for me to see it and be able to actually pattern him you know and harvesting uh, you know it's uh it, you know it's an unsurreal feeling to, to kill you know a 200 inch deer it, it's just unreal. Yep, yep, absolutely. That uh, that's a great harvest. Congratulations, Shannon. Um, oh, well, thank you. Want to have you on the show again? Uh, I know, I know you got dinner cooking, so I'll let you go. But um, thank you again from all of our listeners at Big Buck Registry and uh, sharing your story with us. That's where that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to preserve these stories and sure, uh, talking sure. to guys like yourself to to share those stories so we can keep them around for a long time. Oh yeah, and I'd, I'd be happy to talk with you anytime about some cool. of the other deer I've killed. All right, let's. And the uh, upcoming season, hey, we can always talk about the upcoming season. Absolutely, I mean, yeah. Live and you learn, and uh, you got to learn something every time you're in the woods. Absolutely. And, uh, if well, I can help somebody out, that's truly the best right, well, thing. I I want to see everybody do good. Find another time. Find uh, the next buck you'd like to talk about. We'll bring us through that hunt, and we'll, uh, we'll do it again. All right. Thank you very much, cool. sir. Thanks, Shannon. You have a good night. Uh-huh. You too. Bye bye. Okay, so that was Shannon Bowling, and Shannon, thank you for being on the show and sharing with us all the tips and tricks that you use to harvest big bucks. Next up, we have Ed and John Markowitz. Ed and John are going to speak to us about the torch buck, and if you ha- you might have tuned in earlier this year and, and seen the video that they of the pictures that they sent in. We created a video and put it online, uh, but we actually were able to pin John, Ed and John down for an interview to give us the story behind the buck that just keeps coming back. Uh, so I won't hold it up anymore. Let's go right to Ed and John. All right, welcome back, everybody. This is Jay Scott with the Big Buck Registry, and I am here with Ed and John Markowitz. And uh, Ed and John have had an experience with a ghost buck. Now, we've all had an experience with a ghost buck along the way, um, but we've actually done a video on our website called Torch the Ghost Buck the one that got away and came back. Um, so, Ed, John, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. I, I'm very pleased to have you both on the show. And uh, we've all had this experience with a ghost buck at one point or, or another. But you know that, that this particular d- uh, buck is still hanging around. Um, that is yep. uh, That's pretty cool. It is. I mean, actually, we thought that he, well, he did get shot early or late bow season this year, and I was in San Diego. I wasn't able to hunt out here this year, but Eddie called me on the phone and, and told me that he had heard that he got shot by a bow hunter. So that was kind of very, very, it was deflating. It was, it was a big letdown. Gotcha. Now, Ed, you're, you're from New Hampshire? I'm from New Hampshire. Okay. Born and John, you're from where did you say San Diego? And I well, originally from New Hampshire, but I um I went in the Navy and retired out of the Navy for in you know 26 years. Yep. 
good career. Gotcha. All right. So, so I travel every year, except for last year, I drive cross country all the way. I go to Georgia and Georgia, and then I come up here for the New Hampshire season. So you 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 travel down to Georgia, you come to New Hampshire, and then you um, see what happens with Torch. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I leave. You know, I leave uh, California, drive to Georgia, twenty two hundred miles, yep. and then you there. Um, you know. We do it. I do a lot of food plots and stuff like that for the Georgia deer. Yeah. He comes down and we hunt muzzleloader in Georgia. And then from Georgia, we travel back up here, and it's just the beginning, about a week or two before the New Hampshire muzzleloader season starts. So it works out pretty good. Gotcha. Well, that's pretty cool. That's a good good schedule. Yeah. All right. Take, take me back to when you guys first were introduced to Torch. Well, I would have to say that I was the first one to put my eyes on a deer, but I didn't really know it was Torch. We didn't really name it. I was just sitting in my stand one night. It was um, it was late September, and I looked up into the top of the field, and I saw two nice bucks. One was a high-rack buck, and I was actually texting my brother because he was not out there that night. I said, hey, there was two nice rack bucks coming to the top of the field. Text me back, let me know, whatever. I was napping. And he was napping. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so basically, later on that night, I was walking out, and he was walking up the trail, and I said, dude, where were you? He's like, dude, I was sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> it's a two nice bucks, <clears throat> just about regular every night. So so we kind of we just kind of stayed focused with that, and... He stayed hunting at the top of the field, and I stayed in my local my my stand that I've hunted for years down to the bottom. Of the, mm-hmm. the, the, then basically we went out. Was it two nights later? It was. Like, it was both season. It was still both season. It was both season, and it was still early late September. And we went out that one night. It was like foggy, really. Oh, foggy. it was foggy. It was rainy. Yeah. And I, and that's I think, when that's when John Furrow's first kind of ran into torch, and that's yeah. when he named him. So. Yeah. This is the story from Davy of Torch. Right. I mean, I, I literally, we sat, it was cold that night, it was rainy, and we, he was in a stand, but I, I brought a chair and kind of sat in some bushes and sat there and didn't move, didn't move, didn't move, and then literally um, the deer came out, ran around this field, came up, and when I, I actually have a crossbow, I brought the crossbow up to shoot him, and my scope was completely fogged. Gotcha. So, I, I kind of saw a shadow. I pulled it, pulled the trigger. The bolt went out, and I said, "Well, okay." Well, the deer ran off, and it came out, was running around the field again. I said, "Boy, that was a crazy deer." So I got up to go retrieve my bolt, and I'm walking out in the field, and I looking around, looking around, and um, I start to turn back. And to my left, I see this huge rack deer just standing broadside looking at me probably 60 yards away and I said oh don't make eye contact don't make eye contact don't make eye contact <laughs> but I came him out of my peripheral he was there with a the doe so I walked up to the corner of the field and I tried to sneak down on him I, it wasn't happening gotcha yeah. so you, the, there are a bunch of you're overlooking a field this whole time is that correct yes uh-huh. and and you've seen a few bucks kind of running around, and and torch was torch there the whole time, or did you just kind of? No, I think he popped out. He popped out later. I mean, I think the smaller buck, the spiker, came out, and then he followed more towards dusk. You know what I mean? Okay. Yep. Gotcha. Now, how did torch get his name? Yeah, because well, when he turned and looked at me. Just the rack was so symmetrical and going. It looked like a torch. It looked like a flame. No kidding. And what year was this again that you first saw him? Yes, that, that was, was the first time I saw him. Yeah. Gotcha. That, what What year was it? Two thousand eleven. Two thousand eleven. So this deer is going back two years already. Oh yeah. Okay. So you've got a history of two years, and at the time you saw him, he how old do you think he was? He was probably two and a, two and a half, three and a half, maybe. Okay. Yeah. And he was uh, he's matured since then. Obviously, you've got the you've recovered the rack, 
a, right. cu- a couple of times, correct? No, actually, uh, the year he dropped him, and he actually dropped his, that year, the 2011 set, he dropped him um, the 6th of January, 2012, and I really gave it a lot of effort to find that that rack. There was actually a three good bucks that was hanging around my stand. There was G four, torch, and we didn't really name the wide A pointer. Wide A. There yeah. being a wide A pointer. He was all busted up. Yeah, he, he uh, we didn't name him but he he was the first one to drop. Then um Torch dropped the sixth and the seventh because he came back to the camera with you know one antler then no no antlers and then I made I gave it a lot of effort to look for these handlers, even for G4s, too, and I didn't find a single one that year. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So you've got you've recovered one set of racks. Right. That was this past, this past year. Gotcha. Now, how did you recover them? It was, uh, it was pretty difficult. You know, it was a lot of, you know, going back, checking the camera, you know, seeing where he's coming into the food, you know, where we were kind of taking care of him and stuff. You know, it is just he showed up one night, I mean, on field, and that's when I, you know, I went got the camera, I got the desk, and I went back to the house, and I, I ran back out there, literally ran back out there and searched the corn field from where he came back in. And the only other area I did check was close to the houses, so I went back later on that morning and checked. It was right back, right behind my neighbor's house, and I picked it up there. He was right at the bed. Wow. How far was the distance between the first antler and the second? The first antler was probably, it, was, it had to be at least 300 yards because he dropped his, he dropped that, that first antler on the sixth, and then he dropped, I found the second one on the, the eighth. So it was like a day and a half in between. But he dropped the, the second antler probably about 50 yards from the food, from where my stand was, where, you know, the food plot, as we call it. Right. Now, how many points are we looking at on this deer? Legal points is 15. 15 points. Now, it looks like he's it's the, his left beam, or yeah, I guess it would be his left beam, looks like it's almost split. Yes, he has one split beam that just comes right up. And in 2011, it was just a straight, a straight antler that came up from the back. And he broke off his brow tire fighting or something. Hmm. This year he grew another straight up, but it, it broke, you know, it, it turned into two. Almost like a double main beam on his left side. I was yeah. going to say, it looks like a double main. Um, yeah. I don't think I've ever seen that before. It's crazy. It's, but, see, we also, we had him in velvet and, and saw that he, he was, you know, that he had double main beams. We, we have pictures of him in velvet also. Yeah, you also right. have the. To- Got it. Okay. Now, how many visuals have you had on Torch in the field? Last year? None. 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 Had him in velvet, <clears throat> and then Birdie got shot, and then he showed up at the end of the season. Out of the blue. Out of the blue. I, 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 it was it was when I first saw the video, because I have actually a video camera out there. I actually have a video of him. And my jaw just dropped. I just, I could not believe it. <laughs> right. You can see where he got hit by the arrow. Yeah, you definitely saw his wound. He shot him. He just missed the top of the back because the bow hunter said he double lugged him. So it would kind of coincide with what he thought, where he was aiming, but really where it hit him. So I think what kind of jumped the arrow a little bit. Kind yep. of scooped. So. so this deer is uh, blessed. This, this deer just keeps on living. He's been quote unquote double lung shot. Not really, but he you can see was, you can see the was, the puncture wound on his yeah. side. Yeah. So and he, I, I, two years ago when I saw him during muzzleloader, this deer got shot at by three different people and never got touched once. Yes. During muzzleloader season. Hmm. That's insane. So yeah, I'm looking at this picture. You can see it wasn't a bad shot on with the that arrow shot. It wasn't too bad. In fact, I'm su- was a little high. A little high. A little high. Yeah. Kind of surprised torch didn't go down, but must have yeah. just missed everything. That's crazy. You have like a void there too, some 
it's, you know, some places they have a void where you yep. just don't, or don't hit nothing. Right. Lucky it wasn't a little lower because that would have hit him in the spine and yeah. then it would have been done. Right. Yeah. So now, he was lucky. He's a lucky deer. He's a lucky deer. Now, you guys, are you guys excited? Uh, he's made it through. You're going give to you, give you another opportunity. Oh, I was overjoyed. I, uh, I'm going to dedicate. Uh, I'm going to put in a lot of time next year. But like I said, this year he never came around during the season. So, you know, it's it's. it's I it's hunted a it pretty hard. A lot, of, a lot of places to go. Right. I hunted hard with bow season and then muzzleloader. You know, my muzzleloader season was kind of de- dedicated to torch and. My brother said, "You know, you got to get this deer. You got to get them before anybody else does." And I, I, you know, made it a good effort. You know, the first day of muzzleloader season, I uh, sat in a stand and just kind of, you know, just kind of waiting around for talk, hoping he'd show up because I haven't seen him on camera. But that don't mean he's not around. Right. What's your, what's well, your instincts telling you? Where do you think Torch is hanging out? Uh, <laughs> I he he can hang around within what a five square miles of this place where he's yeah hanging. there's a lot of places there's a lot go. of places he can hide around a lot of swamps a lot of places i mean yeah he can go really anywhere so he's got some some swampy areas that are hard to get to for hunters he can just disappear in there and stay there for as long as he wants nothing's really going to bother him All right as long as he wants to heal well the other thing about this deer too he just really seems he's nocturnal he just moves around at night a lot okay yeah. Mostly, I, I don't get him on camera too often during the day. I think the one time I got him during the day was when he was in Velvet. Yep. Other than, I, they're all night pictures. All right? night, yeah. An hour after sunset or half an hour after sunset. Yeah. So He's smart. So, he, I mean, this, this deer has been educated. He knows kind of when to travel, when not to. Um, certainly understands when hunting season is around, when people start showing up in the woods. So he, he's not going to be an easy deer to take out. Oh, no. no. You're going to have to br- bring your A game. Yeah, that too. you got to really put it on your time and be patient because there's a lot of nice deer out here that you easily want to pull a trigger on and not wait for this deer. Right. Well, that kind of happened to me during muzzleloader season this year because I, well, actually last year, because I was actually waiting for torch and when I saw uh, what the deer we call G4, he showed up, and I'd never seen him all year. Right. Well, my, and he was the dominant deer. He was the dominant deer the year before when Torch actually had his broken. He had a broken brow tine. He was a. He was actually a real tall ape. He didn't have the mass like this other deer, but you know, he just he sprouted over the you know over the year. Yeah. Over yeah. the summer, I think Torch was kind of in his prime this year. Mm. Okay. Black. Gotcha. Well, let's let's go to uh, the G four hunt. Um, take us back to through that hunt. Like what uh, what time of day did you get out? I uh, I was right out at dark. You know, beginning of muzzleloader season, just going out to um, sit in my stand. Gotcha. So it was G four an evening hunt or a morning hunt? Uh, it was a morning hunt. Morning hunt. So you got in pre dawn. I got in about. 6.40 in the morning. It was pretty dark. I changed the card in my uh, my camera just to, you know, just to change it and sat in my stand. Okay. So you're stand hunting. You're not, uh, there's not, there's no snow at this time. So you're, you're going to your stand, a spot you've picked out before. You have, how many stands do you guys have out? Three. Three. Gotcha. Um, all, all private property too. Okay. So, so it's private property. Uh, you have a, a few stands out now. How important is scent control to you guys? Huge. Well, I mean, they're they're big for a reason. I mean, you and I firmly believe in you know taking every advantage of scent control or put putting odds in your favor. I mean, you have yeah. to do it. Yeah. I have uh, scent blocker. I have the shampoo. I do everything. Before oh, head, shower before, shower we go before out. you go, try not to get sweated up. And just make your way out there nice and easy and just sit there and wait. Just, you know, hopefully the sense in your, you know, the, the wind's in your favor. Yep. Two years ago, I actually went out and had a, a, mo- a doe and a fawn, and she was literally, and this is no exaggeration, 15 feet from me. 
15 feet, just sit her head down eating, head down eating, and she'd just pick it up and look at me, and but she never smiled. We're talking 15 feet, but she obviously got the memo that it was buck only during that boat season. Up, yeah. Right. So I could obviously yeah. couldn't shoot her, but it was pretty intense, but she never knew I was there. Right. Well, take us through some of the, the scent preparation that you do. You say you shower in the morning. Um, what, what kind of soaps are you using? The scent blocker soap or, uh, you know, the natural, you know, scent blocker stuff that mm-hmm. we get. Okay. It's a liquid soap. You know, you put it in your hand and yeah. yep. so wash off with Not a bar soap. It's a liquid soap. Oh, yeah. It's liquid. Yeah, liquid. liquid. Okay. What about clothes? Do you wash in a washing machine or do you yep. washing machine with yep. the uh, blocker stuff okay. um, scent. then uh, we let them dry and then we air them out and we spray them down and just kind of put them in a bucket you know, we spray before we go out with our boots and stuff like that you yep. know so you yeah. you take them out of wash you bring them out do you bring them outside to dry out uh, we usually put them in the dryer because actually the scent blocker stuff they actually they have a it activates car- they have carbon in it it activates the carbon inside the the yep. heat does. Gotcha. Okay, so your your dryer actually activates the carbon molecules in the yep. and and it heats it up and it activates the carbon, so that will take care of all the scent. And you actually use the dryer. Then you put it into a bucket or a tub and bring it out to your car, your truck, or truck, yeah, whatever. Yep. Okay, and then you don't do you, do you dress in the field or do you dress before you get to the field? We kind of you know we dress. Before we get to the field, sometimes it depends how far we go. Okay. <laughs> so it just kind of depends. Gotcha. Um, torch, torch hangs out in a very rural area. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, you know. Yeah. Gotcha. Are you? Do you use four-wheelers to get into your stands, or do you hoof it? We hoof it. We, we hoof, yeah. Okay. Use the four-wheelers afterwards if we have to. Okay. Um. So try to keep the woods quiet going in, basically. Gotcha. Yep. All right. T- t- tell me about the G four. So you're 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 out there pre dawn. You've done your scent prep. Um, what happens? Uh, the the woods that you're hunting. Tell me about the woods. Tell me about the terrain. The woods are basically private property. They have, they have bought property to uh, a cornfield, mm-hmm. and um, basically my my property kind of runs in line with the quad field, so that's where I kind of sit because the deer always go to the field. Okay. But it's mainly hemlocks, pines. There's some, um, hardwood, up there's above. some hardwood up above for the acorns. It's a really thick area that is for a bedding area. Yep. Okay. Is it a high spot, low spot? It kind of varies. Yeah, I mean, but the thick spot... I mean, basically, they feed in the cornfield, you know, and in their bedding area, I mean, it is thick. Like, if you walk through, you're not seeing five feet in front of you, and the grass is up above your head. Okay. It's pretty thick. Gotcha. So you walk to your stand in the morning? Yep. Uh, and how, in that, thing, and you know, right? how far from your car to your stand, generally speaking? Uh, probably about couple hundred yards okay so 200 yard yeah, walk it's not like you're walking 10 miles you're walking a couple hundred yards got it all right so you get in pre-dawn and what happens next i'm just kind of sitting here waiting for the sun to come up checking my watch and next thing you know i hear a big kaboom heard a big loud shot like it was a muzzle loader. it was probably about a minute after you know after um it was legal shooting time so mm-hmm. it was definitely a and um, I just kind of stood up in my stand and just kind of waited for something to come through. The only thing that was going through my mind was basically I thought I'd maybe jump the deer out of the field and it ran up above. And it's, uh, some other hunters were probably on the other side, you know, and probably had a deer. And usually you hear one shot. Usually it's a pretty good shot with muzzle of the season. Right. Gotcha. So, so the, you, had, so you actually had some help uh, with from an anonymous hunter probably shot at it at might have been yeah. g4 but whatever it was it got g4 moving yeah he definitely got a moving and um I, you know not not aware of this i just kind of sat in the tree stand until about 
eight o'clock and I just, you know, I had to be to work for 10. So I was yep. just like, you know, I'm yeah. going to head out, just head home, you know, just hopefully come to the night, see what the night brings. So I was basically walking out of my stand and I actually walked down to the swamp that we have and my brother John, he cut out a tree probably two years ago that I was looking at and the deer have been coming, crossing down below and I kind of looked up kind of figured it would be a good tree to put the stand in and I kind of took two steps and I looked up and I saw this nice rack deer coming right at me like it was nobody's business and the first thing I thought of was like wasn't torch right if back up there I really thought I was going to let this deer go until I got another look at him and I said you know what this is a nice deer I'm going to take this deer I waited for him to um, he was probably about 15 yards from me I waited him to hit a hole, and he never hit that hole. Mm. So I had to look it up, see where he was. He was, you know, I kind of looked at it through the hemlocks and stuff, and he stopped because he knew I was there. You know, it was almost like he knew I was there. So I just had to take the shot, and I hit him right through the lungs. I double-lunged him, and he took off, and he actually ran up right by my stand. <laughs> okay. Got to, so, so you were in your stand. You, you heard the shot. You waited, you waited, you waited. You had to go to work. Nothing was happening. You you decided that it's time to go back to the car, and yeah. en route, you went and just checked out an edge that you're familiar with, and lo and behold, here comes a deer coming right at you. Gotcha. But you know, for that instinct, though, I thought for a second, though, I knew it wasn't torch, and I was going to let this deer go, but it was kind of good that I didn't. Right. You know. Now, the... You, you, the deer were, knew you were there. You were in the hemlocks. It was in the hemlocks, and about ten yards, fifteen yards. You said fifteen yards. He was very close. <laughs> okay, very close. That was pretty close. All right. So, w- w- was he moving left to right, straight on, right to left? What was going on there? He started moving. He started coming from my right, and he was just about straight in front of me. You know, I was waiting. I had picked an opening for to take this shot because. You know, with a muzzle order, you want as clear of a shot you can. You only have one shot. Right. So, so he stepped into that opening? and He never stepped in the opening. I stayed put. I didn't move once. I just waited for him to come to me because he was coming right at me. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. If I moved, he would have. But he must have seen me and readjust because I had my sling on my gun. I usually don't still have my sling on my gun because it's added movement. Yeah. Learn from your mistakes. But he must have saw something to stop and I just decided to bring it back and found him in a scope and just you know like I said I double up gotcha so you 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 knew he had, he was there he stops you you find him in the scope it's either now or never take the shot and double lung yep. gotcha I load my gun back up I just went to the spot saw the blood saw the frothiness of it yep I, that's when I decided to load the gun back up okay Gotcha, and then he just beelines it back from the direction you came from. Yeah, he basically jumps over the four-wheeler trail that we have to get out there. And he, the last place I saw him, he jumped the big pine tree that Sandy, we had the Hurricane Sandy. Yep. The big pine tree, and the last time I saw him, he bounded that. I didn't I didn't see him after that, so I kind of figured he wouldn't go too much farther than my tree stand. So. Right, gotcha. So you, you get up to G4, and... What, what do you do then? You take a look. You, I was just like really excited, and then a gentleman comes out from behind me, and he says, he says, did you shoot? I said, yeah, I shot. He said, oh. I said, well, I, I said, I, I just killed a nice buck. He says, you did? He says, how do you know that? I said, I double lunged him. He said, you know, we've been tracking the deer for about an hour. I said, really? So I was like, okay. So I was like, well, I'm pretty sure he's dead right up here because I double lunged him. So we went up, you know, went up there, I saw him, he comes up behind me, and next thing you know, three or four guys come down from the top, from up above, you know, they're kind of on private property, and they come down, and they just kind of, you know, they, the gentleman that shot the deer, I saw where he shot it, it wasn't a very good shot, but he was pretty passionate, you know, he's pretty emotional about it. You know, I can understand him, it was a beautiful deer, it's probably the first. I thought that it was a two hundred pound deer. Yeah. The way I looked, my first two hundred pound deer, and I was pretty excited about it. So he was not 
too happy about it. So, all right, so <laughs> that's an interesting story. So G four, so you shoot you shoot the deer, and there's actually there's a you're back tracking G four, and there's that there's a guy that kind of pops out behind you, and he's tracking a, a, a different buck that he shot. Oh, he's tracking that that deer. Oh, okay. He, so he actually had hit G four at some point. He hit him pretty low. Hit him low. That was morning. Gotcha. Okay. So they're connected. The shot in the morning is connected to the the yeah. to G four. Gotcha. All right. So he, he doesn't take a great shot. You put a double long on. He's a little upset, um, but he's he on. He that he, there was more than one hole in that deer. And he asked me where I shot the deer, and I said, "Well, you see the big hole there, up there, right there, where you know where the ones usually are." Yep. But, uh, he said, "Well, this is my shot." I was like, "Sorry, sir, it was." You didn't shoot him good enough. <laughs> right, right. Well, that's an interesting yeah. dilemma. Like you don't, you, you, you know, it's it only happens now and then. And it's only, but uh, yeah, that's a that's a st- sticky situation. Um, yeah, I was pretty scared for a little bit because there was like five guys to me, and they were pretty upset. And I was just like, "I'm sorry, sir. You know, I was the one that fatally, mortally wounded the deer. Right. You know, it's my deer, and did he? You know." some phrases that not to be said on the radio but right so he was he was pretty upset <laughs> no kidding that's crazy so th- these guys were on private property at the same time though yeah yeah right. i let him know that after the fact after he was pretty um passionate about my tree stand and where it was and said it wasn't on whatever on on he said it was on his property and it wasn't so Anyways, but. gotcha. So, are you guys neighbors? Huh? Is it? It was your private property, or somebody else's? Yeah. Yours? It was their property. It's our association, and uh, just so uh, you, they were legally hunting on that. Gotcha. Wow, that's crazy. Well, at least you got the deer. So you got G four. Um, what'd you do after all the smoke cleared with all the guys? You call your brother. Actually, I called my brother, sent him a picture of the deer, and yep. he was sleeping because he's in San Diego, and it's like 5.30 there. Right. So the next person I called was my neighbor, Joe, and he came out and helped me out with the deer, which was really nice of him to help me out. It cost me breakfast. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> and G4 weighed in. Uh, what, what was the weight on G4? 94. 194? 94, yep. Nice. Very nice. Congratulations. That's that's excellent, Ed. Very happy about it. All right. So now the quest for for torch continues. That's the quest. Well, actually, I didn't learn till, till two days after. I didn't learn till that day from Torch's demise. Two days before that. Okay. So you thought Torch was gone. That's when I learned that Torch was gone later on that night because I talked to a few guys in the surrounding area that. You know, we have really good relationships with, you know, a gentleman that lives up the street from me and uh, another guy that we see on the field all the time looking for antlers in the same area and stuff. And he, he learned, he told me that Torch got shot the Thursday before muzzleloader season. He got double locked. But they, they had no luck finding him because it was raining and just, you know, things happen that way. So Right. Gotcha. And, and then you, uh, Torch shows up on your camera. Um, in December, right, of 2012? After, January. After the first of the year. Okay, January 2013. So he's you're well beyond the New Hampshire hunting season. Oh, yeah. yeah. And you yeah. know you know, Torch is alive and well, and uh, you're going to have another shot at him. Yeah. Well, I think that when I first saw Torch on the, um, the video, the quest became was, you know what? I'm going to find these antlers this year, and I'm going to make a very good effort to find them. And I just, it, it just made it. And I said to myself, it would make my whole year if I could find these two antlers and find them both together. If I just kept them around long enough, and I could just find them, and I just couldn't believe I got, I have them. That's awesome. It's almost, it's almost as better than having the deer in front of you. Right. Yeah. Right. You got a little piece of torch in your hand. That's kind of cool. Uh, now, John, you're coming back for the new ha- the uh, 2013 fall season yep. as well. Yeah. Yep. All right. Cool. And and uh, 
do you guys care who gets torch or does it oh, matter? Not, a, not at all. Gotcha. It's, I, like, it's one of us. It doesn't matter. I'd like him to get him, but and I like. I don't care. There you go. <laughs> yep. yeah, a couple so, of true brothers right there. That's great. Um, well, excellent guys. I appreciate you being on the show and uh, walking through the details of Torch and the, the G4 hunt. That sounds uh, very cool, and I appreciate you spending um, a few minutes with us here and all of our listeners to talk about a good deer hunting story. Mm-hmm. And hopefully, we'll be hearing from you again in the fall. Okay, Jason. Fingers crossed. Yeah. All right, guys. Good luck. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. Hey, take, right, care. take care. Right. Yep. Take care. All right, that was Ed and John Markowitz speaking about the torch ghost buck. Ed and John, thanks for being on the show and sharing us all the insights that you have about deer hunting. Um, next up is Justin O'Neill from True Blood Outdoors, and uh, we talked to Justin to mix it up just a little bit. We're going to talk about some bear hunting. So, Justin, take it away. Hey, everybody, this is Jay Scott, and I'm back with Justin O'Neill, who is with True Blood Outdoors, and Justin uh, runs True, Outblood, True Blood Outdoors down in Arkansas, and it's a bear hunting guide service. So we're a little off topic here, um, but uh, Dusty Phillips just recommended that we speak with Justin. Uh, so, Justin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jay. Excellent. So tell us uh, a little bit about what's going on in your neck of the woods. Um, we're just a backcountry boy, the nothing, no five-star lodging or anything like that, I guess you could say, but we, we have a good time and we, we, we do what we're supposed to do is get people on bears and we enjoy what we do, honestly, uh, we, uh, been doing it for a little while, I mean, we gained a lot of experience, <clears throat> gained a lot of experience with everything but uh time goes uh seeing how everything's going it's yeah it's been a blessing the way everything's worked excellent uh, whereabouts in arkansas are you uh we're located north central um i live in the smallest county here in arkansas it's a real rural area i think there's probably maybe three thousand people in the whole county a lot of land. I mean, it's about a beautiful place. We got the Buffalo National River here. Uh, elk here. It's beautiful. I mean, just if you ain't never been through North Central Arkansas, you need to give it a trip down this way and come see us. That's right. Arkansas has elk, don't they? Yeah, we, uh, back in, I want to say 98, they moved some elk in here to try to see how they would, uh, migrate with the land and everything. And it's really took off, uh, I want to say they brought in 18 cows and 7 bulls in 98, and now they're over, I couldn't tell you, there's 10, 15,000 elk. Is and that they, right? They're really magnificent to see. Now, are they, are they, have they opened up a hunting season for the, the elk? No, well, they got a hunting season. It's a permit draw only, and I want to say they give around 20, 25 a year, and you got to go in to the AGMS website then you get a uh, form and you fill it out and send it in and you, they contact you if you draw a permit and then you can draw public or private land hunts okay gotcha oh. alright I'm on your Facebook page right now okay True Blood Outdoors and it's uh, I'm looking at your logo and you gotta help me out here you have a a a deer skull yeah, as I, your uh, logo okay we're right now we're at a situation that we have the bear the area the territory for bear hunting yeah we're getting into the turkey and the deer okay our deer uh quality i wouldn't be is what you call to want to come and pay to hunt i mean it's just not up to scale around these parts. Um, eventually, we're hoping we can change that and get what we're getting some Arkansas hunts for deer. Yep. But right now, it's just not got there. 
Gotcha. Okay, so you you do have uh, bear hunting is like the something mm-hmm. that's quality enough to pay for yep. a hunt, and then you've got yep. turkey and deer, but and they're coming along. Um, but right now you're focusing on the bear hunting. The bears are bread and butter, and our turkey hunts are they're, they're working their way up a little bit. Um, we just ain't really pushed them as hard. Yep. As we have a bear, because like I said, the bear hunts are our bread and butter. And we focus a lot on that. We getting out there at the public and trying different things. We uh doing going to use uh go through uh let's see what's it called Big Bear Sense this year mm-hmm. and use their product, a lot of it. I've been in contact with him, uh Floyd G- G- Great Gasser, I think is his name. Okay. And uh yeah, we're just, that's that's what we're working on right now. Excellent. So, t- tell me about how do you how do you uh, obtain a bear hunt down there? Do you, do you as a hunter? Do you have to, you call up? You call you guys, and we want to go do a bear hunt. And uh, you you have a, a lodging. You said. Well, right now we're in the state of building lodge. We right now we got a hotel. It's actually a pretty nice hotel. But yeah, why uh, lodging ain't a big focus of mine. I mean, to be honest with you, you're you're hunting during the day. After your hunt's overnight, we got an area that we build a fire, we talk around, we cook a big meal, we got to, you know, just have a good time, just sit around and just shoot the bull and you go to bed and I come get you that morning, like me and my staff, we take yep. you out to your stands, we go from there, but uh, we, we start baiting September 1st in Arkansas, that's when they okay. allow us to start up in zone one. And uh, we bait all month long. Gotcha. We try to get everybody uh, set up to their qualities of what they need. If you call me right now and said, I need a bear hunt set up, and I'm my stand, I'd kind of like, he said, or I got one guy, he told me he's got knee injuries. And he said he needs to kind of be able to move his legs a little bit or stand up if he needs to. And that's fine. I mean, if someone wants to tell me that, I'll be like, all right, well, i got this stand right here, big enough for your platform if you need to move around. I want you to be comfortable is what I look forward to. I mean, you know, if you're coming to pay for a hunt, you should be able to get your money's worth. Right. Gotcha. What kind of uh, – tell me about what kind of expectations um, I would have as a hunter coming in for – for hunting a bear um are there certain size restrictions or certain size bears that i would expect to take while i'm down there well average bear probably on our parts is 250 to 300 an average size now i had probably four bears last year none of them got killed but i'd say every one of them would go over 400 pounds and they all would stay at night i mean they're smart they're just like a big buck They've been there, they've done that, and they're, they know what to do, how to stay out of danger. But, yeah, about 200, 300-pound bear is probably pretty average around these parts. We got a, some chocolate bear. I had three this year that we, none of them got killed. That was on camera. That, and one was a cub, one was a mother, and, and just one, he was probably about 175 pounds. He was just about... Two, two and a half years old, I imagine. And this year, he'd probably be a pretty decent bear. Gotcha. Okay, so you have some good bears roaming around. Um, oh, yeah. Somewhere between 250 and 300. Males, females, are you shooting females as well? We, we don't shoot no females. Okay. They got cubs with them. Okay. Uh, we uh, I stri- I strictly don't want that happening, but... Uh, a female don't always bring their cubs into a bait with them. Okay. If they got, unless they're just to that point of they're comfortable with everything, that they've never been disturbed, they'll, they'll bring them in there and let them get their own food. But if they're not comfortable with everything, they will have their, the mother will bring food back out to them, and that's how they will eat. Gotcha. Um, are there any similarities between deer hunting and bear hunting that you can uh, talk about? Uh, 
the biggest one I would say is you can't beat Mother Nature. Right. Um, when aprons go to falling, it's just like if you got the best food plot, the prettiest, greenest food plot, and you're deer in it every day, and the aprons go to falling, they're gone. And that's the same with bear. Bear can come in every day to the bear bait, and the aprons start call falling. For some reason, they they choose the aprons over something delicious like you know sweet stuff and that's what they want and that's probably the biggest similarity that i'd have to ever seen gotcha gotcha is there any uh, is there any way to hunt bear um on the ground like say you wanted to you know some in some areas you stock deer is it possible to stock a bear here in Arkansas, I, it's, it's not. I mean, well, it could be possible, but it would be extremely hard. Uh, we ain't got the ranges to see the bear yep. like they would up in Alaska or whatnot. We just hunt over bait with bow, and that's the only way we, could, we do it here. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so how would, uh, how would our listeners get a hold of you if they wanted to come down for a hunt? <laughs> Um, they can go on Facebook and find us at uh, True Blood Outdoors, or they can give me a call at 870-504-1846 and, um, and email me at trueblooddoors at yahoo.com, and that's probably the best way to get a hold of me. Okay. All right. Sounds good. So it's uh, Facebook. Just type in under the search bar true blood outdoors and i did it myself and it came right up so um that's great uh the there what there isn't uh an email here in your about page so you if if you just plug that in maybe a phone number too so once our listeners uh start plugging that in that uh that'll help them out and we can get right to you yeah yep awesome justin i appreciate your time and we'll uh i appreciate you having me we're gonna launch this in our itunes podcast here in a, a couple days and we'll we'll include you in the the mix and i'll shoot you an email with the link to the the downloadable podcast all right i appreciate it thank you for having me all right we'll have you again thank you justin uh, thank you have yeah. a great day bye-bye okay so that was justin o'neill from true blood outdoors and he talked to us a little bit about doing some bear hunting in the south and then next up back by popular demand is aaron hill and Aaron is back to share some of those fantastic Iowa buck hunting stories that he uses or um, has participated in. And he uses a pistol to hunt big bucks uh, in Iowa. So I'm not going to hold this up anymore because it, uh, it's just great listening to Aaron talk and share his stories about Iowa buck hunting. Aaron, take it away. Welcome back, everybody. This is Jay Scott, your host with the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. And uh, back by popular demand is Aaron Hill. And Aaron uh, has submitted several buck pictures to the Big Buck Registry. Um, And we spoke to him earlier. um, Earlier this year, we spoke to him about the G2 buck, which was um, basically uh, kind of being in the right place at the right time kind of story. And it was uh, just an amazing deer that he submitted. And that was back in 2006. And we've been so intrigued by Aaron's pictures that we had to have him back on the show. And we wanted to hear the story behind some of the other bucks that he submitted. So today we have Aaron back and he's going to be talking to us about the buck he calls the ice buck. So Aaron, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Jay. All right. We really appreciate you coming back. We had a great time with you last time um, talking about G2. Uh, and we, we covered a lot of your techniques that you use in Iowa in your particular area. Um, but we had to hear the story about the ice buck. Um, so I'll let you kind of start off and uh, fill us in, kind of set the stage for how it all developed. Uh, this deer is actually uh, kind of funny. And, uh, it almost, uh, turned into a bad situation, but <laughs> okay, I like it, like my so wife far. anyways. <laughs> oh, wow. That's uh, that's a different, I wasn't expecting that. All right. <laughs> I hope you patched it all up. No, well, we, we all know as hunters, you know, sometimes you push the buttons a little too far and you're out in the field a little bit too long. And you know, by the time you see your wife, they're, uh, it's already too late. <laughs> yeah. <So, laughs> but, 
you know, I guess uh, eventually they they figure it out and they just kind of let you do it. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, but this one, uh, this book, um, I knew that there was a couple really good bucks in this area. So, uh, me and a buddy were actually uh, driving around glassing sections like I talked about uh, in the previous the show. Yeah. Yep. And, yep. and and really, uh, and I probably shouldn't say this, but it was Christmas Day. All <laughs> 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 right. It used to be a really big tradition in my family yep. uh, to go pheasant hunting on Thanksgiving Day and Christmas morning. And, you know, since there hasn't been too many pheasants in our state for a few years, um, I just kind of made it a tradition to just really drive around, you know, first thing in the morning and uh, check things out. And it kind of got me in trouble this morning. So <laughs> I uh, I will never forget it, and it, it was definitely worth it. But, <laughs> you know, if I think back, you know, it's not worth a divorce. But <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, this, so, this is starting out to be a very good story. All right, let's uh, <laughs> let's continue. All right, you set the stage. Uh, yeah, the the um, we drove around probably. Uh, you know, went went out at first light, and uh, we're seeing a few deer. And it was just one of those mornings that uh, sometimes when it's when it's really cold, and I I believe it was maybe ten degrees, and sometimes the deer don't come out till like 10 o'clock and you know, they, they, I think they kind of, they stretch a little bit, you know, and yeah. they'll get a bite to eat and get some water and then, you know, go back and lay down. So a lot of this is timing. So, you know, we go back to the luck, you know, a lot of times, you know, right place, right time. Right. So we're driving around and, uh, we get to, uh, we get to an area uh, north of where I live and we see this doe and we were only oh what were we maybe four or five miles away from my house and we were just about ready to go home hmm. because this was I think 10 30 11 o'clock maybe Christmas day and, yes <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to bring that up right sorry <laughs> but but I'm sure everybody was uh you know sitting around the tree waiting for me and yep. um okay I was a I was a bad husband I was a bad dad you know it's, <laughs> <laughs> I I won't ever do it again believe me I <laughs> Well you know so, <laughs> sometimes deer hunting gets the best of you <laughs> Yeah it a, does and when you're stuck in that moment um, yeah, you're not really thinking about Christmas presents and and uh, <laughs> trees. Uh, you're thinking about yeah. what's in front of you. <laughs> no yep. kidding. All right, so it's ten o'clock Christmas well, morning, and we were driving basically back towards town, and uh, we seen this doe coming out of this ditch. This is basically. Um, a, a, just about three quarters of a section of CRP grass. That's all it was. It was just, you know, three, four foot yep. of tall grass. And the snow had it packed down pretty good, too. So I mean, we had, I think, oh, maybe a foot of snow on the ground. And uh, we had, we were just kind of driving around that section really slow and kind of glassing down in the ditch. There's a creek that runs through the middle of the section and it was glassing the glass in the creek and um, some of the fence rows and stuff and then this doe pops out like 50 yards from the truck. Hmm. And we all know it's illegal to shoot out the window. It's illegal to shoot off the road. Right. So I, I do hunt this section. So I actually got out of the truck. My buddy got out of the truck. We pulled into the gate hole, and this doe just stood there. Hmm. And we were thinking, I talked to my, I told my buddy, I was like, well, this is the perfect time for you to throw one of your doe tags. Right. So 
we walked down into the field and we got on the fence and we walked through the gate hole and we both, I, I carry my shooting stick everywhere I go. Okay. With my pistol, I, I carry a single, but basically it's a stony, stone mountain. It's, it's a single, single point. Basically it's, it, you extend it so quick and it's, uh, you push it's probably it. one of the best steady rests that, you push a button and yeah, it just ejects and go, goes drops right to the ground. Well, well these just uh, you just twist. It's just like a half twist. And okay. You pull it, pull it down, and you tighten it back up. Gotcha. And i i stick a, I stick it right up against my foot, and yep. I put my pistol on it, and I lean it forward. So it's a it's a perfect rest. Oh wow! Okay. And it, it works better than like a bipod kind of style sometimes when you're when you're walking. Okay. You don't want to carry something heavy right. when you're how many do- around or whatever. How many doe tags can you get in Iowa that time of year, <laughs> by the way? You can get as many as you can purchase. Really? Okay. All right. Good yeah. to know. Good to know. There's each, basically each county has uh, a number of deer that need to be harvested. Yep. It may be 1,200. It may be 1,600. It may be 2,000. Okay. But that is how many doe tags that county will allow. And that is for the archery season, the shotgun seasons, and the late muzzleloader season. Okay. So once that many doe tags are purchased, there's no more left. Okay. So they set the number every year based off of what they want to take care of. Yep. Okay. All and right. they kind of figure that on their deer count that they do every late winter. And yep. So. So you go through. But the... I normally, I normally get ten, eight to ten doe tags. Oh wow! And I. I shoot a lot of does, and I, you know, I shoot probably four or five with a bow, and then I'll shoot a couple of the late, uh, during late muzzleloader season, and I usually only keep, uh, me and my dad will grind one up and make sausage and jerky and stuff, and then I, I'll keep one for myself, and then if any of my friends need one, or my sister, and then I donate the rest to Hush, which is probably one of the best programs there is. What is Hush? That's uh, it's a uh, basically feeding the needy. Okay. It's uh, it's a food program that they we basically donate the deer to the locker, and then the locker donates their time in cutting the deer up, and okay. then they donate that meat to you know to uh, those that need it. The Red gotcha. Cross, or sometimes depending on if there's some kind of situation that comes up and they need food. Okay. All right, so you can get a lot of doe tags. So you've gone through the 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 gate hole. You've you've yep. There's a doe standing in there. You've ex, you've extended the the rest when you're getting ready to mount your your Thompson. Yep. And uh, what happens next? Well, I've got my pistol on the stick, and I I told my buddy I said go ahead and shoot the doe, and I was basically just a backup. Okay. And he sticks his muzzle loader on his stick. And he shoots at this doe, and she was maybe 50, 75 yards. Okay. She was, uh, she was not that far away, and I actually think he might have shot over her because she was so close. <laughs> okay, gotcha. And it, it was uh, not a very big doe. It was maybe a yearling, maybe, you know, right. a year and a half old. So okay. It wasn't a very big deer, but... yeah. He shot at that deer, and that deer bolts across the field. And the um, this buck comes out of the ditch at the very tip. Basically, it was he came out about a hundred, right at a hundred yards. He came out of the ditch, yeah, and like he stretched. And he just comes out of that ditch, and he just stretches. You can just see him moving his neck around, and and both of us are just looking at each other, going, "Holy cow, that is a huge deer!" <laughs> and we're just staring, and you know, and I'm I'm like, "Oh!" And it was broadside. I mean, he just comes out of that ditch, and he's just standing yeah. there. How far away? And I shoot. He was he was a hundred. Hundred yards. A, a minimum of a hundred. Kind of in the direction where the doe was, or. Just kind of caught yeah, right it. behind, or basically right behind where the doe came out. Oh wow! It's just kind of a a, a woolly ditch, like some evergreens and some trees. Yeah, in a, a pretty steep ditch, 
and it runs just basically straight downhill through this CRP field. Gotcha. What what and, is by the way? What is CRP? Can you <clears throat> describe what CRP is? Well, it's it's basically it's uh, it's switchgrass. It's uh, it's brome, and uh, the farmers are allowed to plant so much CRP. It's a it's a crop rotation plan. Is what it is. Okay, and does it have any nutritional value? Do the deer eat it? Animals uh, eat they it. They do. They they eat brome. I mean, brome is actually not too bad for them. It's, okay. It's a uh, it's a pretty uh, pretty big headed grass. So it's a thick, hardy grass that grows fairly tall. Yep. Okay. Big blue stem, little blue stem, uh, switch grass. Some of it gets really tall. Okay. So but they're basically allowed to plant so much of that, and they get uh, government money from for planting it. Okay. Every year. So. And the incentive is simply for crop rotation. Yep, it's really good for the soil. I mean, after you've farmed some ground so so long you need to get nutrition back into the soil so absolutely you'll plant yeah. you know alfalfa or grasses or whatever and it right. brings a lot of nutrition back into the soil keep the keep the uh soil mm-hmm. rich and, and keep the the moisture into the yep. soil so it doesn't dry out and turn into a uh like a black dust storm like uh se- yep. several years ago um yes okay. <laughs> so the 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 buck comes out of the ditch do you think it was startled by the the shot Yes, okay. definitely. If it wouldn't have been for that doe, we never would have seen this buck. <laughs> wow, nice. And if it wouldn't have been for us stopping to shoot the doe, we never would have seen the buck. <laughs> right. Yeah, you couldn't have seen it if you were just driving by. Yeah. Right. I, I think he just was, you know, like, what in the world's going on? And it looked like he'd been sleeping for days. Right. So, you know, he, uh, he comes out of that ditch, and I, I had the... Thompson Center already on the stick, so I mean, I just looked back and I shot. He hunched and ran. Wow! And he ran down to the the creek that we were glassing earlier, and just kind of went over this little knoll and just kind of disappeared. And we didn't see him. And then all of a sudden, when I shot, about ten more deer came out of that ditch, <laughs> and there were like three more bucks in there. Wow! This ditch is not very big. It's maybe. He came out at the very end of it, so it was maybe a little over 100 yards long and maybe 30 yards wide, 40 yards wide, but it was really deep. Huh. It was just a deep ravine. Wow. And I didn't realize that until I got in there, and I was just kind of walking around checking out, you know, why was he in this ditch? Right. Wow. So it's, <laughs> Because it's... I always kind of I like to know, you know, what is the deer thinking, so... Right. But, uh, so we glassed, we stayed kind of right there about where he shot at that doe and we're kind of, I, I immediately grabbed my glasses and I'm, I'm looking down that creek because all those deer ran down towards the creek with him. Okay. And then, you know, over the knoll, then all of a sudden we start seeing these deer shooting out to the middle of the field. And I started basically glassing every deer to see, you know, where's he at. He never came out. Huh. He never came back out. He went down to the creek and then, you know, that was it. So we uh we kind of split up a little bit and my buddy kind of circled around to the beginning of the creek and he walked up the center. Yeah. And I I circled around the other way and kind of cut the creek off so, you know, if, if he kicked him up, I could you know, maybe get another shot. Yep. At a, basically, the cross shot. So, and it it worked perfect. I he ended up kicking him up out of the ditch. Yeah. And he shot at him, and the deer kept running, and the deer was basically I shot him a little bit back, so it was probably maybe a single lung. I mean, he was. He was struggling, but he was he was still he wasn't full full blown running, but he was definitely he was hurting. <laughs> and that was the first shot you're talking about. <clears throat> yep. Okay. So I shot him again running at over a hundred yards again <laughs> and I dropped him right there in his in his traps. No kidding. 
You're getting pretty good at these uh, <laughs> these hundred yard running I, shots. You know, I've told my buddies this more times because they've hunted with me with my pistol, and I'm better off if they run away right. than if they stand there and look at me. Right. Right. Because <laughs> so, you're a little off when you're shooting from the <laughs> when you're just standing still. You know, you gotta you gotta let them uh, yeah. take off and, and give a little challenge. Interesting. So the second one, I put it center body, and but it was he was running away from me, so it kind of went into his shoulder. But I mean, I got both of his lungs right on the second shot, and he he tried. He kept trying to run away and run away, and I was just jumping up and down and you know pumping my fist. <laughs> right. I was excited watching him going down. Right. But the neatest thing about this deer was. When I walked up to that deer, I had no idea that he was really that big, but he was, he had ice all over his rack. Wow. And the picture doesn't do it justice because a lot of the ice had already fallen off. Right. When I first shot him, he looked like a giant icicle. (laughs) His whole rack was covered with ice. That's amazing. And the crazy thing about this story is we had an ice storm. On December 18th. Yep. A pretty good ice storm. And this deer has held this ice for seven days. And he, I swear, he had to have stayed in that ditch for seven days since that ice storm. Unreal. And, and I found out when I gutted him, too, that he was full of grass. He had a lot of grass in him, so I, didn't, I don't think that deer left that field. So he's just eating just regular old green grass. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. I think they just, they do whatever they got to do to survive. But Right. So you got the so deer. I, yep. And we were able to get out of the field and get him in the truck. And, yeah, the worst part was bringing the deer up to the house. Yeah. <laughs> My my highest high went to my lowest low. <laughs> <laughs> in just a matter of minutes, right? <laughs> when I walked in the door and I said, you need to come out to the truck and check this deer out. She said, where have you been? <laughs> <laughs> and everybody was looking at me. Right. The kids, everybody was sitting around the tree eating food and... Yeah, that was the end of that uh, Christmas Day hunting. <laughs> <laughs> so you went out with but, a bang, in other words. Yep. So the well, and I took him to a uh, taxidermist uh, that we have locally in town. Yep. And he's actually a Pope and Young scorer, and he's a phenomenal taxidermist that really doesn't do anything for the public anymore, but he does it for him and his, and his kids. Yeah. What's his name? And <clears throat> Dick Paul. Okay. And he, uh, I, I took the deer to him to see if he could actually cape it out. I cape my own now, but at that time, you know, this was my, my second biggest deer, you know, that I'd ever shot at the time. Right, right. And so I had him cape it out, and on Christmas Day, that makes me a really nice guy, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> So I'm spoiling somebody else's Christmas at the same time. Yeah, right. <laughs> but I, I called him first and just to see when it would be the best time to bring it over. And he said, I'll oh, bring it over now. I got all the kids here. Oh, okay. Nice. So, you know, I knew his sons really well. And uh, so I brought the deer over. And he was a mate all the years of taxidermy. He'd never seen a deer with ice on its horns. And he said, if I were you, I would mount this deer with ice on the horns. And right. I said, that is exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> and how do you so do that? that's what I did. And what did it's you... A, it's a, basically the epoxy, the, basically the same epoxy they use to, to do like the ducks. You know, they have the swimming motion in the water. And okay, yep. They use that same epoxy, uh, you know, to stick antlers and whatever else, but you can make it pretty clear and make it look like ice. Right. Very so cool. So that's what I did. I mounted in that way. That's excellent. 
That is that's that's a good story, and I gotta I have to believe that um, probably a lot of our listeners have been through something similar. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. No doubt. No doubt about it. Um, well, that's a great story, Aaron. And uh, again, I, I appreciate you running through the the story, and uh, it's it's always interesting to hear different stories from different parts of the country because the the terrain's different, the hunting's different. You learn a little bit about each uh, each aspect that's unique to that part of the country, and uh, just the just the the lifestyle. Um, so I really appreciate you sharing all that with us. Thank you. I, I, uh, really enjoy sharing it. I mean, I, it's every hunter, I think it's passionate about the sport, loves to hear stories, loves to tell stories. So definitely. No, we, uh, would, uh, would you be okay with coming on the show again? I know you've been on twice now, but we'd, uh, we've got some more bucks to cover and I, it sounds like you might have some other good stories. <laughs> Yeah, I got some pretty good stories. All right, cool. Well, we would love to have you back on the show. Yeah, I'll definitely do it. Excellent. Aaron, thank you very much again um, from all of our listeners at the Big Buck Registry. We uh, we appreciate it, and uh, keep up the great work. Yeah, thanks a lot. All right, sounds good. Thanks a lot, Aaron. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, take care. Bye. Yeah, bye. Okay, so that was Aaron hunting big whitetail bucks in Iowa. Now, finally, we are here. It is time to announce the 2012 Deer of the Year Big Buck Registry Photo Contest. Coming in at number three, Dalton Campbell. Dalton, congratulations. You are second runner-up for the 2012 Big Buck Registry's Deer of the Year Photo Contest. And Dalton was able to accumulate 337 votes, which is the same as 337 likes in our Big Buck Registry's album Deer of the Year Photo Contest. So congratulations to Dalton. The Okay, let's move right on to the first runner-up. Drum roll, please. Zach McKenzie. Uh, Zach took a fantastic buck that had some very unique markings on, and shapes on the antlers, and he was able to accumulate 486 votes. Congratulations, Zach. That's uh, fantastic. Uh, so Zach is our first runner-up. Now, the moment we've all been waiting for. Uh, this guy has uh, been, is an accomplished hunter out of Illinois, and he we actually spoke with this uh, person uh, a while back, and he um had shared some very cool insights on just what it's like to hunt where he's at and uh we could not be more pleased the winner of the 2012 deer of the year photo contest big buck registry is jamie boyd jamie was able to collect a whopping 827 likes 827 votes on our album page for the deer of the year contest and congratulations jamie thank you for spending time talking to us thank you to zach mckenzie and dalton campbell they both spoke to us as well um and uh, thank you for to everyone for participating in the contest uh and thank you for everybody that participated in the interviews and shared some of those other stories so we're going to do this all again next year everybody so uh tune in in the fall um we'll we'll have a couple of uh, special edition shows between now and september um, but definitely tune in to the longbeardregistry.com and listen to the talk and turkey podcast over there Uh, so uh that's it that's a wrap guys uh thank you very much for joining us this is jay scott your host of the big buck registry big buck podcast and we'll see you again soon 